Hi, this is Rachel, and today we're going to cover topic three, operational definitions. So when we talk about operational definitions, we're talking about how are we describing or defining this behavior that we want to take a closer look. First of all, we need to recognize that behavior is described and not labeled. So we're not going to call behaviors lazy or rude. We are going to label specifically what we saw. So instead of saying someone was being lazy during handwriting, we might describe that behavior as looking away from the materials, slouching in the chair, and not following a direction to pick up their pencil. Since behavior is action, action words or verbs should be used, not adjectives. We want to make sure we're describing exactly what we saw and not placing any inferences um, or subjective criteria. So instead of saying that an individual hit themselves hard, we might say that they hit themselves hard enough to leave a red mark or hard enough to be heard from a distance of more than 15 feet. Uh, you need to describe exactly what could be observed. Um, think of it kind of like a, um, a radio announcer who's describing the plays within the sports, uh, the sporting event that you're watching. They are describing what is happening. Um, they are not or should not be putting in their own commentary. When we are describing behaviors, we want to talk about how do we quantitatively describe the behaviors? How do we put some measurements on behaviors? And there are four main ways um, to quantitatively describe behavior. The first is frequency. How often does the behavior occur? That can be within a certain period of time, for example, within a math class or within an hour. So how many times does that behavior occur? The second is duration. And this is how long does the behavior last? Um, the duration of the whole incident from start to finish. How long did that take? Latency is the third. And it's similar to duration, except that we are measuring from the cue that should have signaled the behavior or, or some antecedent to the start of the behavior. So how long did it take the individual to start cleaning up after they were instructed to clean up? Or how long after I called their name did they answer? Intensity is the fourth one, and this is going to be how strong a behavior is in compared to other behaviors on a behaviorally anchored scale. So I might design a tantrum scale um, from one to uh, 10, where each number has a very specific description of what it looks like. So zero, nothing perfectly happy. One, maybe the person is engaging in some uh, whining behavior, which is defined as uh, a higher pitch um, and maybe making statements, uh, protest statements. I don't want to. I don't like this. Maybe number two, there is crying. Maybe number three, um, there is yelling. Um, any behaviorally anchored rating scale, intensity scale, is going to have to be individualized to the person, just like frequency, duration, and latency, or going to have to be individualized to the specific behavior that you are recording. But this could be helpful to measure some behaviors in a way that frequency, duration, and latency may not capture the full effect, right? If I'm talking about like a tantrum behavior, um, I might be able to tell you how many tantrums there were, how long each tantrum lasts, how long after we, um, you know, showed up at the doctor's appointment until the tantrum started, but intensity would tell me maybe to what, uh, what kinds of behaviors the individual engaged in during that tantrum. So we have to define our target behavior. 
And we need to define it in a way that multiple individuals can agree. Um, we need to describe exactly what the individual says and does that is going to be what we're recording. So I don't want to take data on how many times Johnny was angry. I don't know how Johnny feels. I can guess how Johnny feels, but Johnny might be using different behaviors uh, to express his anger than I might use to express my anger. So I need to define exactly what behaviors we're targeting, um, not what internal states or motivations um, the learner might be uh, engaging in. That's not to say we don't care about those, we absolutely do. But we can't observe private events. We need to, if, we're, if I'm going to observe another person, I need to take data on what I can see, and then they can report possibly later about their internal states or their private events that were going on at that time. But I can only observe what they display on the outside. Um, we need to define how we know when the behavior stops and starts. So for example, if I was going to take data on somebody who hits their head, am I going to count every moment of contact or am I going to count sort of a, a head hitting episode where there might be a lot of rapid taps and then there's nothing for a little bit? That's gonna really matter on behaviors that might occur in bursts or might occur very quickly if you are trying to take just a, a tally count, a frequency count of each individual instance, if they happen in very rapid succession, your data collection may not be accurate. Um, so you have to kind of consider what does this look like for the learner um, so that you can define how you're going to take that data so that you can agree with another person. Um, the point of trying to write our operational definitions where we can agree another person could retort, record that same data is a few things. Um, one, we need to have that social validity that we're all talking about the same thing. If I say tantrum and you say meltdown, um, we might be talking about very different things. So we need to define it so we know what it is we're talking about, what specific behaviors that are occurring that we want to address. Um, we also want to make sure that our operational definitions are written in a way where two people can watch the same behavior and record the same data so that we can have more than one person record the data. Oftentimes, one person is not always going to be able to follow an individual and take every instance of that behavior, take data for every instance. It might be that there's a consultant, that there are technicians, that there are caregivers, that there are school personnel, there are related services personnel, there's private uh, therapeutic services that all may see this learner at different times during their day and may need to also report on the occurrence or non-occurrence of a specific behavior. So we need to make sure that we're writing our definition so that we're all talking about the same thing so that we can all accurately report what we are seeing in our different settings. It's important that all the members of the team are consistently counting the same behaviors. Otherwise, your data collection, when you go back to read that data and analyze that data, it's not going to be consistent. It's not going to give you accurate information if somebody's overcounting the occurrence and somebody's undercounting the occurrence. You don't actually know what the real level of occurrence is. So key features of an operational definition. These are the pieces that um, I find most helpful to think through and make sure that you have them included. So there needs to be a verb. It's an action. There has to be, what is the action? Um, what is the person saying? What are they doing? What does it look like? Um, how do I know that something is happening? What am I observing? So what are the verbs that uh, the individual is engaging in? 
we need to define that stop and start so we can tell when do we start the timer and when do we end the timer. When do we mark a tally and when do we not mark a tally. Um, we also need to define where, when, and with whom. So where is where the behavior is occurring. Um, some behaviors we might be interested in taking data no matter where that behavior occurs. This may be especially true for overly adapted behaviors that we are seeking to decrease across settings. However, there are some behaviors that only uh, when we're taking data only should be occurring in certain locations. So that is part of that context. When we talk about writing operational definitions, although some of my examples have been uh, behaviors that we might want to be targeting for decrease, uh, we still need operational definitions for all the behaviors that we're targeting to increase. So if I want to work on my learner using the restroom in the toilet, the where is very important to this operational definition because eliminating in a diaper or eliminating in their underwear would not be the correct behavior if we were targeting uh, toilet training. When, similar. When is the behavior supposed to occur? Is there um, a certain parameter around it should occur uh, at, at these certain times or does are we counting it no matter when it occurs so for example a greeting if i want to take data on whether or not my learner is responding to greetings i need to consider the when of when are they uh how quickly they respond is part of that when statement so for example if i say hello johnny and johnny replies hi within five seconds, great, that's my win. He replies within five seconds. If I say, hello, Johnny, and he doesn't reply, and then two minutes later, he looks at me and says, hi, that would not be um, a response to a greeting because there's been too much of a latency, right? The latency between when I said hello and when he responded is too great for that to be considered response. It might be considered an initiation at that point, and it might still be appropriate and something that we want to look at. But if I'm looking at responding to greetings, it would not fit my definition. With whom, again, same type of thing. Are there specific individuals or specific situations in which this behavior should occur? If I am targeting uh, reciprocal play with peers, then the with whom is the with peers. It doesn't matter if the learner does it with an adult because that's not our behavior that we're tracking. We are tracking whether or not this behavior occurs with peers. So an operational definition might have um, a, uh, sorry, an operational definition should have a verb, should have a stop and a start, and you should include the where, when, and with whom. Now for some behaviors, you might be taking data where, when, and with whom across anything. So I might say that my operational definition for um, hitting someone would be that the learner um, moves their hand with an open palm and makes contact with another person with force great enough to uh, change the direction of the other person. So if I go that way, then that's great enough force. If I'm just touching, then that wouldn't count as a hit. It starts the moment the learner makes contact. It ends the moment contact ends. So that would be three separate contacts um, because it would be at each type it each time it makes contact. The where and the when with whom would be I'm taking date on this anywhere at any time with any person because this would be a behavior that I'm targeting for decrease. There's not a context when it would occur and I am looking to uh, decrease this behavior. Perhaps, perhaps there might be situations where I do want 
this to be okay. Um, maybe there are certain games or activities where it is appropriate. So then you would exclude those. You would include that in your definition, um, does not include like a high five or something, right? Um, in contrast, if I am working on a behavior to increase, um, then I might uh, use a greeting, right? So the verb is that the individual, um, for this response, we're going to go with the individual waves. Uh, they move their hand in a left to right fashion at the wrist. Um, the stop and the start begins when they get their hand above their shoulder and ends when their hand is no longer above their shoulder. So this would count as a wave, this would count as a wave, but something like way down here wouldn't count by this definition as a wave. Um, the where would be, maybe I'm targeting specifically um, at home settings. Um, when is when a new person, um, or we're gonna do responding to greeting, is within five seconds of someone saying hello or goodbye to the individual and the with whom is any um, any individual in the home who maybe they haven't uh, interacted with in the last hour, right? Because we don't want every time I look away and then look back at you, me to say hi to you again, that's not necessarily the appropriate timing for a greeting. So something along those lines. For the assignments, you would practice writing some operational definitions. Uh, write an operational definition for responding to someone calling your name. Write an operational definition for attending during story time. And then write an operational definition for recruiting someone else's attention. Now, these can be written with specific individuals in mind. I think that that is the best way to do this because when we're writing operational definitions, we are not trying to write an operational definition that would account for um, the way that every individual would perform that behavior. We are writing an operational definition specific to an individual. So think of an individual, if not somebody that you're working with, think of yourself. Um, what would it look like to respond to someone calling your name? Hey, Rachel, what would it look like when I respond to that? How quickly? What would be my where, when, and with whom? My verb, my start, and my stop. Um, what about attending during a story time or a group lecture, right? So if you work with individuals that are in upper grades or in college or might attend meetings, use meetings instead of story time, right? What does attending look like in this situation? Do they have to be looking at the person? Or could they be taking notes instead? Do they need to be sitting in a certain way? Or do they just need to be sitting where they're not spread out and in contact with other people? Write the verb, the stop start, the where, when, and with whom. And then recruiting someone's attention. This one gets a little tricky. Um, we don't define recruiting someone else's attention by whether or not that person responded. Sometimes you can, right? If you want to define like they, they continue to attempt to recruit someone's attention until they're successful, but we can't be responsible for how somebody else responds. Our learner may raise their hand appropriately in class and the teacher may never call on them. That's not our learner's fault. Our learner's still engaged in recruiting someone's attention, perhaps for that situation, right? So make sure that your operational definition um, for this one especially, but also for any operational definition is not contingent upon somebody else's behavior. You're gonna define the setup. So when this happens with this person in this setting, learner will X, Y, Z, here's how I know when it stops and starts. Okay, that's what you're gonna write. Not learner will do this and so-and-so will respond in this way, or learner will do this until so-and-so responds in this way. We can't control their behavior. 
we are writing an operational definition for our learner and our learner's behavior alone. All right, so that is topic three, operational definitions. If you wanna give it a try, feel free to put some operational definitions down in the comments and I'll be happy to provide some feedback on those. I may have the opportunity to post some more examples of operational definitions as well. And hope to see you next time when we continue our supervision topics series. Thank you.